Lovecraft. You already know him, you don't need me to sit here and explain who that is, right? The bare bones, Lovecraft is the guy that everyone invokes whenever any kind of tentacle shows up in any form of media. I mean, really any media. And what's the problem with Lovecraftian games then? Well, there are many. When you search Lovecraftian as a term on Steam, you will see that the list is near endless and the quality certainly varies. I've played a lot of them over the years and I have to say that I've never really played a Lovecraftian game based on an actual Lovecraft story that's really touched my heart in any way. Today we're going to look at a few of the bad ones and a few of the good ones to see why it never really seems to work. And in order to end on a positive note, we'll start with the bad ones. So. Gather around the fire and let me tell you a tale. Some of these games fit neatly together here. Narcosis, Canarium, Call of Cthulhu, Doorways, Holy Mountains of Flesh. They're walking simulator type games and for the most part have little to no actual gameplay past picking up an item every so often, causing a cutscene to trigger so that we might have our pants frightened of. When I played these games, at best I was mildly intrigued. At worst, I was terribly bored. It's a blessing that the majority of the Lovecraftian games are not very long, but when it comes down to it, they weren't really games. They were haunted houses. You control the character walking through the haunted house, but in the end you had very little real control. More often than not, the game tries to force scares with creepy visuals and, too often, jump scares. I don't need to tell you that jump scares are not Lovecraftian in the least. And all of that would be fine if there was a compelling story to tell in said games, but again, the majority of them don't have good stories. Like most horror games, the Lovecraftian haunted houses convey their story through notes in most cases. Even when you're underwater, there will somehow still be notes, like in Reveal the Deep, which, while not a walking simulator, it was very close and had us reading note after note in the big blue sea. Those notes are no longer legible and you can't tell me otherwise. The haunted houses stop at their literal definition, walking around with occasional spooks. The main character is almost always alone, so there aren't any characters to add to the depth of the story either. So in every game I was left going through the scribbles of long dead passersby while nodding my head like I hadn't already read this exact same version of dreadful murderous note a million times before. Some of these walking simulators really do try to add gameplay to the best of their abilities, like Moons of Madness but it just never really works out because the gameplay seems to be a side quest for the developers. How could it not be? Walking simulators are a genuine category in video games. They focus on telling you a story. But again, if your entire story is told through notes and notes alone, then you can't expect your audience to engage. If I wanted to read the story, I would have just picked up a Lovecraft book again. It's me again, Mary. How I keep finding the time to write down what's going on in between running away from the monster, I do not know. All I know is that the monster is, it's. Oh, come on now. It's your girl. Mary, back at it again with the notes. Last time, I was about to tell you about the monster, but was rudely interrupted by said monster, causing me to be unable to finish this note and, in the process, letting it end on a cliffhanger. So, I was going to tell you what the monster looked like. It's... Really? Okay, to the point. The monster looks like a banana. Uh... A banana? Hello. Well, that's anticlimactic. You're not exactly scary. Well, it's entirely subjective, don't you think? I mean, I'm scary to someone. I'm sorry, you're just reminding me of the Mac Tonight commercial right now. I'm not even a moon! Yes, well, you're also not scary. Oh? Okay, fair enough. Well? Right, yes. But there are also Lovecraft games that add plenty of gameplay. Roguelikes like Lovecraft's Untold Stories. I played that game for a good two or so hours before I rage quit and I do not rage quit easily. I loathe this game. 
Not just for the gameplay issues it has, like strange hitboxes and badly implemented traps, but for the way it invokes the Lovecraft name so blatantly, only to suck round garlic-shaped coconuts. This game has a sanity meter, the laziest way to call your game Lovecraftian, but it also includes reference upon reference upon reference to the stories of Lovecraft, to the point where one of the vendors appears to be Hastur and, I kid you not, Lovecraft himself shows up as another vendor. You fight a star spawn as a boss, read the Necronomicon and only lose a little bit of sanity, everyone yells for Tagen at random, it's honestly insane, but not in a good way. As I said, the game also has gameplay issues, such as immediately selling items when you double-click a vendor accidentally, causing me to lose an item that quite frankly had already broken the game entirely because it allowed me to regen sanity whenever I wanted to, allowing me to read 50 Necronomicons without bother. For a roguelike, there also isn't nearly enough action. I spent most of my time walking around grumbling at the trap's hitboxes, then I did fighting enemies that were worth half their salt. And in case you were wondering, because I'm sure you were, no, the game also isn't scary at all. The references to Lovecraft's stories are cute at best, like their reanimator quest, and distracting at worst, like their Lovecraft as a vendor insert. I also felt a slight pang of annoyance when I realized they'd put Dagon and Cthulhu on the same level as Azathoth and Nyalathotep. If you are HP Lovecraft, I'm gonna scream. Now, at the time of playing this game, I was pretty mad, I'll be honest, but when it comes down to it, I don't think for a moment that Lovecraft's untold stories was meant to be scary in any way. How could it be? You can defend yourself quite well, where the walking simulators don't let you do pretty much anything. In games like these, the entire objective is to defend yourself from the Lovecraftian horrors. There's plenty of games that just make fun of the Lovecraftian genre or the stories in general. One of them so obvious about it that it's called Cthulhu Saves the World and you fight your way through monsters while quipping cleverly and saving the world as Cthulhu. There are quite a few games like that, so I won't bring up all of them. I just need you to know that they exist. But the last set of games I do need to talk about is the lip service type. Games that definitely say they have Lovecraftian influences, but don't really do very Lovecraftian things, like Sherlock Holmes The Awakened. This game is nuts, but again, not in a good way. It is absolutely riddled with bugs, terrible interface issues, terrible controls too, now that I mention it, and the way certain scenes play out are hilarious more often than not. Hi. Boat. Boat. Watson, I know this accent. These people are Nepalese, and as luck would have it, I am familiar with this dialect. Nepalese? Holmes, are you sure? Aho Nitra. Chigong Senitra. Ah, Nitro. Tro. Bo Petro. Toro Mitro. Toka. This woman says her family has suffered a grave misfortune. This altar is for her son, a lad of 16, who disappeared just one week ago. Could he have run away to sea, or some other youthful adventure? Il koga bratsein, but presindakum. Bo petro, toro mitro, ka, waeta, do ikoto, ah, nito, tro, petro. She said a man was seen in the area making inquiries about her son and their family. The man worked at the docks and had a silver eye. Yes, exactly. He was a vile man with one silver eye. Malinhe gas, sundre brokat hardu. She also says her son's belongings are on this altar. She says we may examine them and take anything that might help find her son. Holmes, they sought nothing less than the end of the world. <laughs> what nonsense! <laughs> Thank you, Barnes. I must leave now. Goodbye. Unfortunately, this game bored me to tears too, so after another crash, I just gave up and uninstalled. I'm sure at the time when this game released, it was fine, but Pixel hunting and maps too large for one single man just aren't of this era anymore. But yes, this game uses Lovecraft as a backdrop. It just works even less than any other game already would because it uses Sherlock. And this guy does not emote no matter what's going on. I say, my good chap, do keep it down. Holmes! Holmes, my leg is chopped off! Oh, so it is, my good man, so it is. Terribly sorry about all that noise! That's quite understandable, old boy. Carry on! 
This game also touches on another problem with Lovecraft-inspired games, however, and that's the overuse of the exact same stories constantly. Namely, the most used story of all time, The Shadow over Innsmouth. But also Cthulhu in general, as is used in Sherlock. You know, where you name your game something something Cthulhu, except there is no sight of anything Cthulhu related to be found. Because of course, the Sherlock game is dealing with the Cult of Cthulhu, except when the Cult eventually tries to summon Cthulhu, they are thwarted because Holmes turns on the lighthouse. Because Cthulhu is scared of light? And that's the problem when you include great beasts like Cthulhu in your game. It's still a game, and most of the developers will want you to be able to defeat the great evil and win. Save the day, get your happy ending. Some games, like Call of Cthulhu, Dark Corners of the Earth, do technically have a bad ending, but the problem is that only happens at the end. The horrors seen throughout the game should, by all accounts, be enough to drive a man crazy enough to straight up die, and yet, the protagonist fights Dagon and wins all without going absolutely bonkers. From the actual story Dagon by H.P. Lovecraft, then suddenly I saw it. With only a slight churning to mark its rise to the surface, the thing slid into view above the dark waters, vast, polyphemous-like, and loathsome. It darted like a stupendous monster on nightmares to the monolith, about which it flung its gigantic scaly arms, the while it bowed its hideous head and gave vent to certain measured sounds. I think I went mad then. Does that sound like a creature some dude can just get rid of with a ship's cannon? Dagon from Lovecraft would whack the ship in half to begin with, but this is a video game and we, the player, have to have some way of overcoming the danger. However, most Lovecraftian video games that draw directly from the books will put an existing Lovecraft entity in front of you as an enemy or a puzzle to solve. You have to fight the monsters from the mythos and that doesn't work. It doesn't work because Cthulhu cannot be defeated. Dagon cannot be defeated. Not just because they, as an existing creature, would be far beyond the scope of man-made destruction, but also because their inherent fear comes from our helplessness, our inability to deal with them. Think of any survival game with guns. Do you ever feel completely helpless? Like you can't win? Like there's no way out? You are doomed? No, because you have guns. And the game has established that you can win with those guns. Your enemy can be killed with guns. You'll be okay. Now think of a game like Amnesia. You can't harm the monsters that stalk you. In fact, you can't even really look at them without ending your game. The point is not to look at them. It's to outrun them and somehow make it out of there in one piece. Your only option is flight. You don't really understand what's chasing you, only that it can harm you. There are some games that find a nice middle ground, of course, and we'll talk about those later, but that is the basic difference. The creations of Lovecraft were never meant to be fought. They were not meant to be understood. They were meant to exist, and you were meant to be made aware of their existence. That is all. To both revel and despair in the knowledge that we are not alone in this existence and that those greater than us care little whether we live or die. What that means for Lovecraftian games is simple. You cannot use Lovecraft's stories and monstrous beings. Ever. No, not even Cthulhu. Because they already have a story and their story makes it impossible for your protagonist to deal with them without falling victim to madness. The following excerpt is from The Call of Cthulhu. The thing cannot be described. There is no language for such abysms of shrieking and immemorial lunacy, such eldritch contradictions of all matter, force and cosmic order. A mountain walked or stumbled. God, what wonder that across the earth a great architect went mad and poor Wilcox raved with fever in that telepathic instant. The thing of the idols, the green sticky spawn of the stars, had awakened to claim his own. The stars were right again, and what an age-old cult had failed to do by design, a band of innocent sailors had done by accident. After vigintillions of years, great Cthulhu was loose again, and ravening for delight. When you put Cthulhu in a game, you are no longer allowed to win, and in fact, when your protagonist lays their eyes on any of these creatures, they should immediately die of a heart attack, or go stark raving mad, equally resulting in your almost immediate death. Those are your only options. 
The moment we try to understand Lovecraft is the moment we lose. The majority of Lovecraft's writings are difficult to understand. They have strange beginnings and ever stranger endings. Most of them don't even really have a distinct beginning or end. One of the stories that does have such an easy to follow structure is The Shadow Over Innsmouth. The Shadow Over Innsmouth has everything a game might want from a story. They have a protagonist set out to solve a mystery, strange enemies, a chase in the middle of the night. They even have the least amount of madness inducing creatures you could find. Honestly, that's probably because most of the games I've played on this one kind of ignored the existence of a Shoggoth. Except, again, Cthulhu Dark Corners of the Earth. But when it comes down to it, games based on the Shadow over Innsmouth are generally just a worse version of the written story. The developers have to decide what's scary for you when Lovecraft's horror banks on your mind creating the worst of it. Just like they did for Lovecraft himself. While Lovecraft took a great deal of inspiration from his fellow authors, Lord Dunsany, Edgar Allan Poe, Algernon Blackwood, the list goes on. Most of his creative ideas came from his dreams and nightmares. You are the only person who could ever scare yourself to death. Let me tell you of a recurring nightmare I have to this day. It pops up every once in a while, sometimes with a few months intervals. I'm in an old house, entirely made of wood. It's strangely tall and rickety. When I climb the stairs, they never end, and outside the windows is nothing but darkness. I'm not alone in this house. There's a group of people. My father is always there alongside one other person I know well. They always change. The rest of the group I don't know, and we're led by a tour guide of sorts. The tour guide knows the house, and they know it's haunted, but tours still go on. As we walk from room to never-ending room, she tells us about the house, all the while strange things continue to happen, threatening people's lives. Everyone ignores it until the tour guide tells us this is her last tour. Everything goes wrong, but indescribably wrong. I can't tell you exactly what happens except that my brain knows it's wrong. The world gets darker, but it's a strange black light, where the darkness stays visible somehow. People around me start dying and I run up the stairs again. I keep running endlessly until I find a room where I find myself. I've been writing down this entire story on an old typewriter and I tell my ghost self that it's time to go. So I disappear from my typewriter. I run into the room to collect impossible things when my father appears behind me to tell the real me that it's time to go. We run down the stairs again until we get to what we feel is the bottom. It looks exactly like my childhood home's hallway, but it's dark and still made of wood. The way out is blocked by something that I can only describe as a Valkyrie ghost child. But I'm aware the child is ancient, not the trope you find in books sometimes. It's like meeting an entity that exudes a sort of ancient wisdom. She stops us and tells me I'm supposed to ascend, but it sounds so threatening I don't know how to react until a strangely demonic horse tries to burst through the door next to us. I say horse, but only because that's the closest I can come to a description. I cannot describe the actual demon. It doesn't have descriptive features and it scares me to death. My father slams the door shut and we rush out of the house together. I wake up. This dream always scares me. The dream is often lucid and I feel real terror as I traverse this house that I know but don't understand. That is Lovecraftian horror. I don't understand. And it's what not only games but also movies just can't replicate. How could they? Fear is inherently personal. What's scariest to you might not be to someone else. Games that keep rubbing their Lovecraftian influences in our face, like including a Necronomicon or things like that, could never hope to strike fear into our hearts the same way our own brain can. If I can comprehend what I'm looking at, I'm not scared anymore. If I understand it, I can find a way to deal with the terror, either by fighting it or running. Either way, I'd still be sane. Outlaws 2 is a good example of the way the fear of the unknown trumps anything else. There is an antagonist in that game. At the start, you haven't seen her, but you hear her every so often. Your vision is largely obscured, and when I hear her drawing near, I feel the fear creeping in alongside her. I don't know what she'll do, what she looks like, I know nothing about her. And then she killed me. The death animation takes some time to show me her face, her weapon, how she kills me. I'm annoyed, 
no longer afraid, just annoyed I got caught. She doesn't scare me now, she's just become an obstacle on the way to see more of the story. Oh man, what do I do? I can hear it, but the shadows are too deep. <laughs> no, I'm too young to die. What monstrosity hides in the dark of night? <laughs> <laughs> I... Wait, what? <laughs> You're... That's... What? <laughs> really? Where's the banana, now a unicorn? <laughs> yeah, well you're not scary either. I can see you sparkle. You were scarier before I could see you at all. I love this again. Ah! Even when a game truly tries with their designs to bring you Lovecraftian horrors, we somehow still feel the need to add eyes and mouths on largely the normal positions. Because how will they see without eyes? How will they roar? We can't comprehend a creature that doesn't rightly need these features, so we make sure to add them. Which is exactly the problem. We make them more normal by doing so. But there are exceptions to the rule, of course. What's their secret? They don't set out to be Lovecraftian games. They might be inspired by Lovecraft's stories, surely, but they don't adapt his stories. They don't reference the material. They create the exact Lovecraftian atmosphere needed for existential dread to creep in. Games like Darkwood show you little of your enemies. Your vision is limited. The scariest of your adversaries are never even seen. They simply kill. The world around you is largely indecipherable and even your allies may not be who they seem. You trust no one, you die easily, and by the end of the story you don't win. You cannot win truly. You've tried to make things a little better, but in the end, you are but one small cog. Games like Bloodborne and Darkest Dungeon create their own story with their own creatures. And of course, sometimes there will still be references, like the Darkest Dungeon DLC that includes the thing from the stars, but largely this is their own creation. And at least in Darkest Dungeon you can in fact die of sheer terror. In Bloodborne, you can never really win. The Great Ones always have that one extra edge. No matter what, in the end, the best ending you can achieve is by eating several items that turn you mad. That is your best bet. If I can comprehend what I'm looking at, the fear fades. Technically, the moment we can look upon a being without losing our minds, it cannot be Lovecraftian. Lovecraft only works in books where our minds can do the heavy lifting. The grand fear is to know that the Outer Ones don't care about us. We are nothing to them. We are insignificant to them. What most people now see as Lovecraftian is tentacles. Ironically, there aren't really that many tentacles in Lovecraft's stories. Yes, really. In fact, most horrors aren't really described outside of I can't describe this. Cthulhu is used as often as he is because he is the only one that is described in much detail at all. And even then, he only really shows up in a single story. Lovecraft never meant for him to be his mascot. And yes, that means it's impossible to make a Lovecraft game in its truest form. Does that mean all Lovecraftian games are bad? No, of course not. Like I said, I very much enjoyed Darkwood and Bloodborne, and even Eternal Darkness. The sanity meter, corny as it is, works well considering how they handle it. In general, we have to accept that to make a game work, you have to add systems that don't make Lovecraft's true horror work. Most of the time, anyway. You can't have a game with zero mechanics. At that point, it's just a movie. And Lovecraft movies don't exactly work out most of the time, either. Lovecraft is just one of those tricky subjects that will never translate well to the truest extent of its content. The best we can do is take liberal inspiration from what he created. At this point, Lovecraftian has taken on a whole other meaning outside of Lovecraft's stories and creations. Yes, there are the games that simply retell any of Lovecraft's stories, but those are, quite frankly, rather dull and probably the worst example of a Lovecraft-inspired game. The good Lovecraftian games take what Lovecraft did and make it their own. They create fear by telling you nothing and showing you even less. They make you feel small and weak. They make you struggle as you go, all the while telling a gripping story about beings so beyond you, it's impossible to comprehend their true designs. You are not the protagonist, merely an observer of a greater cosmic plan. So, 
I would like to leave you with this quote that opens the story The Call of Cthulhu. A quote that, I think, encapsulates the Lovecraftian feeling that I chase in games quite well. The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far. The sciences, each straining in its own direction, have hitherto harmed us little. But someday, the piecing together of dissociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality and of our frightful position therein, that we shall either go mad from the revelation or flee from the deadly light into the peace and safety of a new dark age. To whomever inevitably reads this note in a future horror game, I have failed. These halls hold many monsters. I will attempt to name some so you might fight them more easily. No sooner had I disarmed the banana, or a monstrous bird-like creature lunged at me from seemingly nowhere, claws outstretched. I named this creature Walgai. I only escaped with my life after it was distracted by another beastly visage of no less than fifty writhing tentacles slithering towards us at some speed, which I named Kulsta. I ran, only to narrowly escape the void breath of an ever-shifting dragon called Lokmuin. And so I ran straight into the maw of Robertson, whom I can only describe as a stream of lava come to life. And yet still, there was more to come. I hear them slither now as I write. Septic, a cat with seven heads and seven tails, screaming in tones I could scarcely understand, nor did I want to. Mike swears, what I first thought was a simple mountain, stretched its appendages towards me with a low grumbling. Adrian Peckle, darkness itself, ran to escape this one's reach. When I at last reached the entrance once more, desperate for escape, Ray Ray descended upon my position with a vengeance, tearing at the walls with claws or fangs or... What? The void traveled with him. I ran once more, but as the walls crumbled, I became hopelessly lost and now forever trapped. I will not make it out alive. They have found me. Farewell. Remember to save often.